Today I'm going to be talking about sort of spatial structure considerations when we're talking about conservation of grassland species. And this whole idea is revolved around the idea of spatial ecology, where populations live on a continuum of spatial heterogeneity. And the idea here is that understanding how populations exist in space is key to understanding their dynamics, how they persist, how they grow, et cetera. But how the species use that space is going to vary depending on their natural history strategies. Because of this continuum, species are basically exposed to different types of heterogeneity and therefore the evolution are going to be evolved to exist on certain aspects, parts of that continuum. So today I'm just going to cover a couple of these topics. As you might imagine, they're all very large, huge topics about spatial structure and how we look at it from a metapopulation and landscape ecology point of view and how that then affects conservation. I'm gonna do a lot of this with examples. They won't necessarily be species you're working on, but hopefully you can see how some of the ideas and what people have done might apply to what you wanna do. And then I'm gonna wrap it all up. So spatial structure then, again, as I said, populations exist in space and space is heterogeneous. And what species are going to do then is they perceive that variation as habitat where they live. He called those patches. That's where a local population lives, dies, the whole thing. That's where your dynamics occur. And then not habitat, which in the lingo is called the matrix. They don't live there. They go in there, they're going to die. And that spatial heterogeneity is going to be either natural or human made. And the two main ways people think about spatial heterogeneity nowadays is metapopulation ecology and also landscape ecology. And so you might want to ask, well, why do you care about this for conservation? And early on, the spatial ecology literature really didn't care about conservation. It was just really sort of an interesting problem. But humans have radically changed the landscape that species have adapted to. You can just think about the spatial, uh, what's happened with prairie. And because we've radically changed that landscape, the species now have to deal with that, how we changed it. And they may or may not be able to do that on their own. So by looking and determining what this new spatial structure might be and what problems a species might have dealing with that in light of what they've evolved with, so their natural history, hopefully will give us some insights into how we could actually help them. So let's talk about these metapopulation and landscape ecology. So when you think about metapopulations, many people think about islands. Now island biogeography and metapopulation ecology are really not the same thing. But what we're dealing with in metapopulation ecology is what we would consider a patch network. And some ways of thinking about that when you look at a piece of ground is what people call a low coverage landscape. In other words, where the animals are able to live, suitable habitat patches are basically a really small fraction of the total area in which they're living. So the interest then, that's what makes the network. Interest then is in patch area isolation effects. And an example is native prairie in Minnesota. All the red is where the patches are today. The yellow is where it used to be. So humans have changed this sort of really large area where an, a species could be not a metapopulation, but sort of live anywhere in that matrix to just where the red dots are. In contrast, landscape ecology is dealing with a mosaic of patches. In other words, the animals or the species, they are not restricted to a certain kind of habitat, but are more plastic. So if it looks like grass, they'll try to use it. So another way to look at that is what we call a high coverage landscape. When you look at this picture here, there are many patches there that can be of varying quality, but the animals are basically living there. And the interest is in boundary or edge effects, landscape connectivity, landscape composition. So I'm going to talk about some of the very important uh, issues or just describe what a metapopulation is. And I want to start with the base or what people call the classical metapopulation, because that's where everything comes from. And then talk about two specific kinds, 
mainland island and source and sink. So what is a metapopulation? So it is any assemblage of discrete local populations with migration among them, regardless of the rate of population turnover. And that last phrase is important because early on, metapopulations, because they look at colonization and, and extinction, it had to be really fast in order to see that. Think about humans. We live a long time. If we took a metapopulation approach to humans, it would take us a long time to actually see extinctions and colonizations in contrast to insects, which you can see very quickly. So there's this argument about whether or not you could apply metapopulation ideas to something like humans or long-lived species. So by saying, we don't care how long it takes you to do that turnover, that basically broaden it to actually, you can apply this to about, just about anything. And the idea here is when we talk about a patch, which is where you have to have this patch idea, um, it contains that local population. And that's what is, we have to maybe think about that network. So it looks like this. We have patches that have our flowers and our insects are using that and anything outside that they die, they're not gonna use it. So that's what a metapopulation looks like. And what they're really interested in is the understanding the proportion of occupied patches. And they do that, metapopulation has always been driven by models. I'm not gonna show you the models, I don't want anybody to worry about that, but it's the idea that they're interested in that change in proportion of occupied patches by looking at the difference between what is colonized, the proportion that are colonized at any one time, minus the proportion of the ones that go extinct. And basically, you have persistence of a metapopulation when colonizations exceed extinctions. That's the idea of the extinction threshold. Now, this is a very simple model. It's, does, it's actually aspatial. It basically assumes we got lots of patches and they can all get to one another. Um, but it's the basic idea that we've got this extinction threshold in metapopulations that we have to worry about that's important. So this fundamental idea is that we have this stochastic balance between local extinctions and recolonizations of empty habitat patches. And it's stochastic. That means in any one time, your particular patch may not have a population. It may be empty. But over time, you will see it'll come in and out. In other words, that's the whole idea of things winking on and off. And what this also implies is just because you have an empty patch, that doesn't mean it's not an important part of the metapopulation. So here's just this idea of winking on and off. Let's assume all of these patches are part of the metapopulation. Some have populations, one, some don't, zero. And put your eye on one part of the screen and I'm just gonna show you over time what might happen. It looks like this one year, Next year, it looks like that. Next year, it looks like that. Next year, it looks like that. Again, they all are important, but your particular patch might not be occupied all the time. So when we're taking a metapopulation perspective, we are really interested in things that influence colonization. What's the distance between the patches? Patches that are far away or farther away will not get as many colonizers. And how do they get there? Well, that species has to get there. So how they actually disperse or can move through a landscape or the matrix itself is really, really important. The other thing they're really interested in is the factors that influence extinction. Now in the metapopulation framework, that is the size of the population, which is equivalent to the size of the patch. That's how they make that link because smaller populations, we already know this, have a higher chance of going extinct. Because we're equating size of population with size of patches, that's where you get smaller patches have a higher chance of going extinct. So that's why from an extinction point of view from a metapopulation, how big those patches are, where the species exist, that's key to understand. Now, as I said, this earlier model didn't really explicitly talk about differences in sizes and things like that. And so it was quickly, people have, scientists always change things. So they quickly changed it to mainland island where the patches now are of different sizes and also source sink, which is also known as habitat specific demography. And this is where patches are of different quality. 
Because in all the, this modeling I had talked about, they assumed patches are equivalent in terms of quality, but it can be different. And so how do we look at this in a metapopulation perspective? So the mainland island model is pretty simple. We allow patches to be big and small. And basically the system has one or more very large populations, which we consider the mainland, and several smaller populations, which we consider the islands, hence mainland island population. They're still interested in the same thing, the change in proportion of occupied patches, still looking at the difference between colonized patches minus patches that go extinct, but in a mainland island model, colonization is driven from the mainland to the island. So the large patches are the ones that are giving you those col the colonizers to go into the patches that go extinct. And what that means is under this model, the probability that these large patches or the mainland are gonna go extinct is extremely small. So that the higher the colonization rate, you have the higher proportion of occupied patches and the higher the extinction rate, you have the smaller the proportion of occupied patches. And remember, the extinction is going to be happening in the smaller patches. So it turns out a lot of populations have this mainland island structure just due to the fact that we have variability in patch size. And in some cases, that variability is driven by humans because of changes in land use. But overall, when you have this kind of system, the metapopulation persistence, it's going to you know, survive or not, is driven by the persistence of those large patches. And that's why these smaller populations, these islands are the ones that go extinct more frequently. However, there could be something horrible that happens and that those large patches basically get wiped out. In that case, these smaller islands may be the only way for that population to recover. So when you have a mainland island model system, you should not think islands are unimportant. They are actually really important in the whole scheme of things. So let's go into an example. And this one comes from uh, Indiana and it's a regal fritillary. And that butterfly was once quite widespread, but it's now fragmented due to habitat loss. And so this is an example of a human caused metapopulation. Regal fritillaries were not actually normally a metapopulation. And so this whole question of the regal fritillary is part of a very large scale designed restoration of sand prairie at Kankakee Sands. And it's a really big, large partnership. And they explicitly wanted to take into account species like the regal fritillary that have very specific habitat requirements in terms of the species, the violet species that they need to uh, reproduce. So what they did is they, so they have an A shows these dashed deans. Um, they have, these are state lands where the regal fritillary are on. In the lower left, they re bought land around those areas for restoration purposes. And they planted the violet species that they thought were native because they wanted to use native plants and um, left them for five years and said, and then went and said, okay, what happened? So what was interesting is there were three violet species on the, basically on the metapopulations, the little deans that were being used. They thought one was not native, so it was not planted. And then they took the ones, the other two they thought was native. One of the species, the ones in, I'm not sure you can see the triangles, but anyway, the, they basically came and found that only one of the two species they planted took, you know, basically it became established. But the third species, the ones in the circles, actually be, was very aggressive and it just sort of took off. It was a weedy species. And um, so they have now this weedy species plus these other native species. But what happened was in part D, the butterfly really responded to those species that those the fact that they have now the violets so they actually by planting around those small leftover populations they basically changed it from a meta population to what we would call a patchy population they made this a really really big island 
and what they found is they found butterflies, regal fritillaries, beyond the restoration, up to 35 kilometers away. So they realized, looking at it from an even bigger scale, they actually created a regional mainland island metapopulation by planting these violets around the deems rather than saying we're going to you know, create different deems elsewhere. The other thing they said is we actually made that they made a mistake in plant classification. That species, the one in the circle, it's that, that the third species they thought, that weedy aggressive one, turned out it was native. But they didn't know it. They made a mistake. And so they talk about how you have to be really careful when you're really focusing on native species. You might want to take a clue from what the animals are actually using and actually think a little bit harder about what you should plant in your restoration. So it's a really interesting thing. So that's the example there. Let's talk about source and sink. So this is the idea that some patches, local populations, have negative growth at low density due to basically intrinsic habitat factors. They're called sinks. They don't really push out anybody out of those patches. The other patches have positive growth rate at low density and they have excess individuals that leave. Those are the sources. And the reason why this low density issue is in there is because uh, we don't want to get, the question is what happens when you start getting up to carrying capacity um, and that throws in a wrench. And in fact, that throws in a wrench that gets into this whole idea of what they call pseudo sinks. But before we get there, I just want to remind you that habitat quality is not size dependent. Large patches aren't necessarily sources and small patches are not necessarily sinks. So you have to be careful there. So small sources can go extinct. And they, if they're driving your system, you can get in trouble that way. But this variation in patch quality and consequences of density dependent growth can lead to what they call pseudo sinks. Now, I don't like that term. A pseudo sink is a patch, a local population where immigration is not necessary for survival. Basically, what this is pointing out is that sources can have varying levels of carrying capacity themselves. There isn't just one carrying capacity. And if it's high or low, you can be fooled by thinking the ones with low carrying capacity are actually are sinks rather than actually a low quality source. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example of why that's important. But from a conservation viewpoint, then, this whole issue of patch quality is generally thought to be under the control of the manager because the, the conservation person determines what habitat is there and how it's actually managed and maintained. So that's why sourcing is typically uh, important to think about. So let's talk about this whole issue of pseudo sinks. And this example comes from California. It's another butterfly. This is actually in a forested system where the butterfly only lived on natural granite outcrops. So it's naturally, this is a natural metapopulation because it's a naturally patchy system. And it used two host plants for eggs. Now this is in the Sequoia National Forest. And in 1967, they clear cut areas of the forest. And what came back um, where potentially now new areas where butterflies could be. And in fact, some of the host plants started to grow in the clear cut area. And in this case, one of the two actually died out and a third species took over. Initially, the butterflies didn't use them. So it was sort of like, this is now a sink. But by 1979, the butterflies actually started using that third new plant. In 1985, which is where the picture is, so the gray, is the outcrops and those dark black blobs are the clear cuts is the new system. So you now have this patchwork of granite outcrops that only has one plant and the clear cuts with that new plant. And they had evidence that those clear cuts now were sources. The question is, what well, actually were those outcrops? Were they sinks or pseudo sinks? Now, the only reason, only way to actually figure out if you have a sink or a pseudo sink is to actually cut off all immigration or all colonization to a patch, which generally means you have to get rid of what you think are your sources. Most people don't want to start doing that 
So in this case, there was actually, what happened was, it, there was a natural experiment. Basically, some weather events came in that actually eliminated your local populations and also impacted the new host plant in that clear-cut habitat. By 1993, the butterfly was extinct in the clear-cut habitat, so all those black dots became zeros. But what happened to the rocky outcrop? What happened there is that the butterfly densities actually started to fall, but they actually stabilized. So actually, the rocky outcrop itself was actually a source, but it's lower quality compared to what was going on in the clear cut. So in this case, both natural and man-made habitats were sources, but of different quality. Which brings up some questions for conservation. So, you know, human changes to the landscape produced that new habitat that wasn't there. It included a new plant species as that butterfly was able to use, but it wasn't naturally there. So the question is, should we be doing this? Should we be making new habitat? Should this habitat be maintained? It isn't quote unquote natural. The other thing is, if we think back to the Kankakee Sands, they didn't include a violet species originally because they thought it was non-native non weed, even though it was used by the butterflies. They were actually happy to, very, to find out that their weed was native because that's what really saved the restoration for the butterflies. But what if that violet species was really a non-native species? What if some of the species that come in in our, in our man-made habitat, we decide not to worry about whether they're nat native or not? So should we be considering non-native plants in our conservation plan for a teeny species if we're worried about source and sink and quality of the habitat? Just some things to think about from a metapopulation perspective, particularly sources and sinks. So now I want to move to landscape ecology. Um, and this is for understanding sort of those matrix or high coverage landscapes. That's where that's useful. And landscape ecology in general is the study of the effect of spatial pattern on ecological processes. As you can see, that's extremely broad and it was broad on purpose. It's broad on purpose because much of this, what is a landscape, depends on the species of interest. Now, what we have in the background is a landscape. It's a landscape for grassland birds. But if you're interested in ground drilling beetles, that's probably not what the landscape is. But landscape ecology ideas can be used depending on the history, life history of the species. It can be scaled up or it can be scaled down. And the scaling is important because questions vary by scale. You can look at landscape ecology from a regional perspective, where we're looking at habitat amount arrangements on population trends over these really large scales. We can look at a regional landscape level. In this case, we might be interested in how responses of a species to landscape structure changes during changes of varying habitat amount and as the population size itself changes. And then there's also landscape patch, which is how the landscape factors affect what is actually happening, happening within the patch itself. The examples I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna focus on the landscape patch scale, mainly because a lot, a, lot of, a lot of work has been done at that scale, and it might give you some food for thought for thinking about things at multiple scales as well. So looking at it from a landscape patch perspective, the question really is, is how are grassland species affected by the landscape in which they live. Topics such as area sensitivity, which has to do with the size of the patch, edge effects, which has to do with what's around the patch, corridors, which has to do with how they move through an area. Those are all important and driven by the landscape composition of the area in which you're working. And we have studied a lot of this for a variety of species. Uh, the one that I'm going to focus on to give you examples of how landscape affects these different uh, top uh, ideas is going to be grassland birds. So we know a lot about grassland bird response to patch and landscape. And these are two examples in South Dakota of two different landscapes that the birds have to respond to. They and this particular study was looking at native prairie patches. In some parts of North Dakota, excuse me, South Dakota, there's a lot, they're huge patches. 
of native prairie. And on my left, you have a lot of fragmented. And to be honest, what looks what's on the left is what looks like what's that's what Wisconsin looks like. We don't have a lot of stuff on the right. But regardless of whether you it looks like the left or the right, when you ask the question, how do birds respond to the landscape in terms of whether they'll be on a patch or the densities might change, we have some pretty common uh, themes. First, grassland birds are more likely to occur on patches that are embedded in grassier landscapes. So the composition of the landscape around the patch you're interested in affects whether or not the species that you're interested in might actually be on that patch. And in this case, their landscape was 3.2 kilometers. And we've seen this in uh, studies in other parts of species ranges. Another thing, when we talk about edge effects, what we find is if your patches are surrounded by woody edges, you're less likely to occur on patches with lots of woody edge. And this is for both, here's an example of a grasshopper sparrow and western meadowlark. So that's your edge effects. Area sensitivity is also affected by what landscape you're in. This one happens to be work that I did with a student. This is on pasture in, we, in Wisconsin. And we looked at landscapes that had high amount of wood and a low amount of wood. And for bobolink and savanna sparrow, the density of the birds basically didn't really change by patch size if you were in a grassy landscape. You only found an area sensitivity effect when you had a landscape that had a lot of wood in it. And in fact, in the South Dakota study that I showed you earlier, they make the point that if you are in a landscape where you're not seeing area sensitivity effects, like you're in these really big areas of native prairie, if you start to see area sensitivity effects, you might be in trouble, which is an interesting way of looking at area sensitivity and applying it sort of in a conservation framework. Now, I did talk about birds because I work on them, but I do want to point out that this whole question of landscape importance to species is not just birds. Wild bees is a huge area of work right now, looking at how these different bees are affected by landscape composition. And for bumblebees, and um, it was really important. So the percent area of natural habitat surrounding the study sites was important for explaining bumblebee colony growth and reproductive potential. And the landscapes for a bumblebee is not as extensive as for grassland birds. Again, landscape ecology doesn't depend on a certain you know, size of landscape. It's scaled to the species natural history. So you know, think broadly when we talk about landscape composition and landscape effects. So those are the two major ways of looking, structure, looking at spatial structure. And some of my, the examples I gave you, I hope you can see how they could influence conservation strategies. Many times the work is done via modeling. They're often used either GIS based, um, but a lot of times we also develop conceptual models that can be helpful. But a lot of times the ideas will basically, they'll use both ideas from metapopulation ecology and landscape ecology. Um, and so they become complex really fast, um, but it's, it's, you have to try to structure your ideas in some way. And how you do it is really going to be up to you. So again, metapopulation and landscape ecology, because of the way the fields have developed, have different tools that can be used in conservation. So in metapopulations, we're going to be looking at uh, dispersal ability, migration range, and looking at sort of patch networks. In landscape ecology, we're looking at sort of that mosaic. And so again, our interest is going to be in how do we basically develop or um, yeah, look at that landscape and what we want it to look like, plan that landscape. Can we plan a landscape? So let's go into metapopulations. Metapopulation, like I said, is very much mathematically driven. 
And in fact, many things that can help from a conservation perspective use models similarly to population viability analysis, which hopefully you, know, you may have remembered or, or seen in your population ecology course. The questions about how long will the population persist over a time period or time to extinction for a population can be also asked for a metapopulation. So the metapopulation models can be used to answer that question. What's the probability my metapopulation persists, say, over 50 years or 25 years? How long does it take for a metapopulation to go extinct? And something that appears to be used a lot, starting to be used a lot, is this whole question about determining metapopulation persistence for a very specific network of patches using something called metapopulation capacity. And this is where you do explicitly model the colonization and the extinction for a specific patch network. It's not a theoretical thing. It's actually, I have this network and I want to know how good it is. And it's been used on things like pandas and China and things like that. Um, but what it is, it, it is a way to capture the impact of landscape structure, which is the amount of habitat in its spatial configuration on metapopulation persistence. And metapopulation capacity then can be used to rank your landscapes in their ability to support a viable metapopulation. So theoretically, you could take areas you're interested in, model your colonization and extinction, the whole thing in those two landscapes and actually calculate your metapopulation capacity and figure out which one might have a better chance of giving you a persistent metapopulation. Basically low values of metapopulation capacity means you have a higher risk of extinction. The other thing by doing the model and using metapopulation capacity, now I haven't seen anybody brave enough to use this, you, I've done this theoretically, you can take a patch network and start taking the patches in and out and you can get a value for the individual patches and the effect also of what if you add a patch in the middle or on the edge. Think about wetland mitigation. I have to replace this wetland. What if I do it this size this far away? Theoretically, you could use a metapopulation capacity approach to give you some idea of how things might fall out for that metapopulation. But because I have, I mean, it's all theoretical at this point. The example I want to do is actually something that they use in the Atlantic forest of Brazil. They looked at 127 species of forest species and they used the IUCN rankings from least concerned to critically endangered. And the gray are the least concerns, the red, of course, are critically endangered. Now, a lot of times people will say the most important thing to look at for these different species at these different levels is how much of their range is left. So the remaining range is what you should be looking at. And that's what they looked at in A. However, that's just the total. What it doesn't get at is, well, how fragmented is that range? So what they did is they actually modeled, they had a general model that looked at fragment size for the different species and they actually calculated metapopulation capacity. Because you may have a lot of land, but if it's all fragmented, that doesn't really help, now does it? And so that's what B is. And so again, having low numbers is not good and high numbers is better. And not surprisingly, you're vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered. They're really in trouble. They're in the low end for the metapopulation capacity. But what the reviewers actually, excuse me, the uh, writers actually talked about is this gray bar, the gray part in low metapopulation capacity. Even though IUCN isn't concerned about them, from a metapopulation point of view, from a fragmentation point of view, they could be in trouble. And so their you know, lesson is you can't really be complacent about common species. So how about landscape level conservation? So landscape level conservation is where you, you're looking at the local patches combined with the composition of habitat in an area beyond that patch. That's the landscape. The area beyond the patches are your landscape. And that landscape is going to be species specific and location specific. Modeling approaches are all over the map from computer GIS based, mathematical, conceptual. But management basically occurs not just at the patch level, that's still important, 
but also you have to consider landscape level management. So the example I wanted to give is a conceptual model that's used in Wisconsin, which is Wisconsin Grassland Bird Conservation Area. And Grassland Bird Conservation Areas are used in a variety of ways. In Wisconsin, the one that was actually designed was actually designed for obligate grassland pasturing. So it uses ideas about area sensitivity. That's why there's a 2,000 acre core. We live in a state that is basically privately owned. And so the landscape is going to be a working landscape. So we're going to be working with people to use um, agricultural practices that are quote unquote good for grassland birds. And we're, all, we're also going to put this in an area, a landscape that is already good, like not a lot of forest. And so our models, of course, are always square and they look beautiful. But really what they look like is what's on my right, which is an example of an actual on the ground, Perry Primrose Beeper conservation area where the state and partners have lands and easements, et cetera, to keep this landscape open and good for grassland birds. Management is done by the partners. Uh, they're trying for this BCAA, they're trying to increase the amount of grassy habitat and they also do a lot of outreach to private landowners. So this particular landscape level conservation is focused on the composition and increasing the amount of grass targeted around the fact, around a core permanent grassland owned by the state. But not everybody is going to be doing just increasing the amount of grass, right? What management actions in the landscape is going to depend on what you're trying to do in the species, right? In our case, before that was grassland birds, but you may not be interested in grassland birds. So you might have turtles, which are biphasic, which they have to use their ponds, but then they have the upland nesting habitat. And fragmentation and changes in land use have made that increasingly hazardous. And so from a landscape perspective, you might have to worry about increasing connectivity to get an area that those animals can cross without getting smacked by cars, for example. Or prairie grouse, which don't really fly as much as, you know, the passerines compared, they actually uh, walk a lot. But basically, if you're trying to look at them getting between areas, you might have to worry about removing woody features in a big way in a landscape and think about how you might do that, particularly if like in Wisconsin, it's privately owned. So what you do in a landscape and how you do it is always driven by what your focal species are. So I think the key thing is we have to realize we have changed that landscape in which all these species have lived and we're imposing this spatial structure that may or may not match what the species evolved in. And metapopulation ecology and landscape ecology are two ways to look at spatial structure, but both have this idea of colonization and extinction. It's important in both, even though it can take different forms. They're always both interested in dispersal, movement, patch size. Those are also common viewpoints. And if you truly have a metapopulation, the landscape composition itself will always provide context for conserving a metapopulation in an actually in a specific area. So unfortunately, regardless of which viewpoint you take, there aren't any simple rules of thumb that are quantitative. Do so much and it'll be great. It's species specific, it's context specific. I can tell you larger is better than smaller for patch size, regardless of what the species is, but I can't tell you which one is better. How you get to bigger, can't tell you how to do that. You know, Regal Fritillary, they were able to do sort of a fill-in, okay? Alternately is, can we go to another area that's within, you know, range of these dispersal abilities and start something there? But I don't want people to despair. I mean, there's a lot of real world examples to learn from because landscape seal conservation is actually uh, being done by a lot of people. But ultimately, the species will tell us if we get it right and like the people at Kankakee Stands, be ready for surprises. And with that, thank you for your attention.